What's up guys, the results are in. I've analyzed 100 games from players rated 1600 to see what kind of mistakes they're making and why they're losing the games. In this video, I'm gonna share with you what I found and give you some tips on how you can fix those issues so you can get past 1600. And by the way, if you're wondering, it does take a lot of time to go through 100 games and analyze each one. I do actually open up each game individually and look through and see what mistakes were made and what caused the player to lose. So if you do learn something from this video, if you don't mind hitting the thumbs up and consider subscribing, that really helps me out a lot and I really appreciate it. All right, without any further ado, let's jump right in. All right, so here are the results. At the top of the list, we have blunders at 41% and tactics mistakes at 26%. So really interesting thing about the blunders is that 41% is higher than what I saw when I looked at the 1400 rated player games. If you remember back from that video, there was less blunders in those games than at the 1600 level. And honestly, I can't really tell you why that happened or, or what was going on there. Maybe it just had to do with the sample size, the 100 games that I happened to look at. I really was expecting to see less mistakes at the 1600 level, but it didn't happen. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about blunders. I think everybody knows what they are. You just have to be as careful as you can to make less and less of them if you want to get past 1600. But I will show you one quick example. So this is a game both by 1600 rated players and black gets off to a very bad start. You can see right here, he ends up losing his rook. So he falls for this little fork loses a rook and he continues to play on and I wanted to point out something that he does which is, is pretty smart if you ever lose material like this one of the best ways to give yourself a chance to win the game is to try to go for some sort of attack on on the opponent's king because if you're able to checkmate him it doesn't matter how many pieces you're down right now it doesn't always work but he did a really good job of setting up a little trick and it worked out so he brings his rook over um, and then right here, so he's lining up this bishop on this diagonal, which is smart. And then after white retreats, he decides to trade this piece because it's forcing white's queen back. And then he's able to capture with his queen. And what he's accomplished by doing that is creating this battery. So in chess, it's called a battery when you have two pieces that are lined up on the same diagonal or on the same file. So black actually has two batteries here. One is going this way on the file and, and one is, like I said, here on the diagonal. And it's really a pretty obvious threat in in my mind um if if white was doing any sort of blunder check he would have noticed that hey um my pawn's being attacked twice and my king's right there i have to be careful but he's got it defended so he's fine and even just a simple move like rookie one and, and white's completely winning but this guy just captured the pawn and that was it G game over so i was really surprised to see this kind of mistake at the 1600 level but you saw the data, I mean, 40 over 40% 40 of the games were, were blundered. So so the takeaway is do a blunder check and be careful. You never know when you know something like this might happen and completely one game becomes a loss. So let's move on. All right, so next on the list, we have tactics mistakes. I've said this before, but again, the best way to get better at this is just to practice. You have to practice and practice and practice. And as you do more and more tactics, you'll get better at them. I will show you one quick game. So I'm gonna go quickly through this game. The opening was, Pretty standard, both players did a good job, developed their pieces, castled, nothing really to look at right here. I just wanna to get to the point where the tactics shows up. Okay, so right here, um, okay. Black plays b4, and he's trying to trade some pawns, and, and there's nothing wrong with you know creating some queenside space like he's doing, but he failed to realize that when white played queen f3, white was setting up a little tactic. And so after black played a4, then b4, white was able to do it, bishop takes h6. So this happens a lot when the h pawn is pushed forward. So like white's, you know, h pawn is up. If the pawn is pushed forward and there's a piece attacking your knight, you have to watch out for the bishop sack, right? Because if black tries to recapture this, white's queen's coming in and taking the knight. And so it's essentially a, a free pawn for white because of this little tactic. And so now that white was able to remove that h pawn, not only does black have one less pawn defending his king, he's also got some pressure here with white has a lot of pieces on the king side and he kind of falls apart after these next couple moves. And here black played knight f5 trying to, you know, put pressure on the bishop. He blocked the queen from, from the knight, so now he can take it, but he's just blundering a piece, right? Um, nothing really to look at here. It just fell apart for black and 
Another little tactic, discovered check on the queen. And after king f8, he, he loses the win. He could have played king g7. It's still not a good position for, for black. But anyway, queen's gone, game over. So just work on your tactics. That's really the only tip I have. You have to just practice and you'll get better over time. All right, so third on the list, we have lack of opening knowledge. So 16% of the games that I looked at, players were getting into trouble because they just didn't really know what to do in certain opening lines. And so it looks like the 1600 level is really when it starts to get a lot more important that you understand some more opening principles and even some opening theory in some cases. Prior to 1600, it didn't come up very often at all, but like I said, now 16% of the time is enough when it really benefits you to really learn some opening theory. So let's take a look at two quick examples of some of the games that I looked at. All right, so the first game, Black plays this knight to d4, which is called the Blackburn Shilling Gambit, and it's a very tricky line. A lot of times white will go for this free pawn, which really isn't free, and then uh, black plays queen g5, sacrificing this, and after queen takes g2, it's actually really good for black. I have a video on my channel. I'll link it down below if you want to see how that works. Very tricky line for black, um, but in this case, white was smart enough and didn't take it. He just captured the knight. It looks like black was just playing for that trap, and after white captured, he didn't really know what to do. And after queen h5, he just fell for this cheap little trick. And, uh, you know, the fork picks up the rook and it was over. He resigned a few moves later. So there's nothing wrong with playing for a trap like this. I've actually played this myself and it can be a lot of fun when white captured on e5. You play queen g5, but you have to know a little bit if they do a better move. Like, oh, if they take on d4, you have to have some idea of what to do. So like against queen h5, queen f6 would have been a, a good move. Defends d4 pawn, defends the, the checkmate. It's not great for black, but it's playable and it's worth taking a little bit of extra time to learn a few of the important lines if you're gonna play a certain a certain line. All right, the next example I wanna show you about openings is what is called the Stafford Gambit. This has been going around YouTube quite a bit. A lot of YouTubers are kind of talking about this. It's very tricky to play uh, against. If you're white and somebody plays it as black against you, you have to be very careful. You can get into a lot of trouble if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so this will be a good one to, to be aware of. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, uh, after you capture knight c6, this is the Stafford Gambit. And the idea is that after white captures, which is what happened in this game, but the idea is that black has a lead in development, so his knight's out, white's pieces are still in the back rank, and black has all these open files and diagonals. Really, he can put his pieces wherever he wants and get a really nice attack on white's king. And that's exactly what happened in this game, and white didn't know the proper way to defend it or what kind of setup he should go, go about. And I'll just show you what happened. So bishop c4, bishop c5, he decided to castle. And after knight g4, black has a really strong attack. He's got pressure on f2, and he's got queen h4 coming next, and this bishop is defending. It's, it's very tricky for white. And sure enough, uh, white tried queen f3 after castles. There's a checkmate threat on h2. He played h3, and then these guys got forked by the knight. And after queen e2, bishop sacrifice on h3, queen comes in, and it's all over. White has to sacrifice his queen to stay alive, and black went on to win pretty easily. So you can see from this example, there really wasn't much of a game here. Black knew what he was doing. He understood the Stafford Gambit and the ideas behind it. White didn't. White got into trouble right out of the opening, and now he's just losing. And so opening preparation becomes much more important, especially in lines like this when someone plays a gambit on you and you accept it. If you don't know what you're doing, you can very easily get into big trouble. And by the way, if you are wondering what you should play against the Stafford Gambit, there's nothing wrong with accepting it. Um, but then the engine recommends queen e2. The idea is you're going to go ahead and defend these pawns right away. And after something like bishop c5, you can play knight c3. And if black tries to go with knight g4 again, putting pressure here, you can play knight to d1, defending it. Uh, this is what the engine likes. I haven't actually studied the Stafford Gambit in depth. If you guys want to see a video on this, let me know in the comments below and maybe I'll put something together and we could kind of analyze what exactly white's best plan is. But this is good as far as stockfish is concerned. White's almost up two pawns here. Everything's pretty much defended. That's the way to go. But it is very tricky to play against if you don't know what you're doing. So opening theory, much more important at the 1600 level. All right, fourth on the list, we have time pressure, 7% of the games. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Players got low on time and either lost on time or just blundered because they didn't have time to think about the position. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. You just have to learn how to manage your time properly, which is really a topic for another video. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the last one on the list, which is bad endgame technique. 
All right, now even though this is at the bottom of the list and only six out of these 100 games it made an impact in, this is really, really important. And I think as you get to 1700, 1800, it's gonna become more and more common that most games are decided by end game technique. So if you haven't studied end games up to this point, now would be a really good time to get serious about that. It's gonna make a huge difference. If you don't know where to start, I'll link a book down below that I read when I was kind of learning about end games. It helped me a lot. It's sort of intermediate level. It's not super basic, but it's also not that advanced. It covers a lot of the, the basic stuff that you really should be aware of. I've made it to 2200 with what I would say is, is a relatively basic endgame knowledge. I haven't studied endgames extensively, but I do know the basics and understand some, some basic things. So check that book out if you're interested. But now I wanna just show you a couple of games. All right, so this was a game between two 1600 rated players. I'm gonna go quickly through the opening. It was a little strange, but summary is that black came out on top up a piece and i want to get to the end game where things started to fall apart so okay so right here okay so right here um white plays rook takes e6 all right so let's just look at this position for a second everything is pretty much equal rook rook knight knight there's four pawns four pawns the only difference is that black has an extra bishop right an extra piece and if you have an extra piece at the end of the game you should be able to win. 90% of the time, this is gonna be a win for black. But what I saw at the 1600 level is that quite a few people didn't know what to do. They would get in a position like this where they're completely winning and they just didn't know what they should do. So I wanna pose a question for you. In this position, or really in any end games in general, what is the most important thing? You want to put it in the comments below what you think the most important thing in an endgame is. Um, I'll read them later and see how many people got it right. Or you can wait till I tell you and then put that answer in. Anyway, the most important thing in an endgame are the pawns. Okay, the pawns are the most important thing. If you if you remove all these pawns, and I have a rook and knight and a bishop against a rook and a knight. I'm not gonna be able to win. you know, Unless by some miracle, my opponent blunders a rook or a knight or something, I'm not gonna be able to win that, right? I need a pawn to get a queen. Right? That's how I'm going to win. Or that's how I'm gonna lose, right? If, if one of white's pawns becomes a queen. Pawns are the most important part in an endgame. That means you have to defend your pawns. You can't lose pawns for free at the end of the game. So knowing that, what is black's best move in this position? Well, if you said bishop e8, you would be correct. Bishop e8 is the best move because it defends this pawn. You know, it's kind of a defensive move. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You see, this pawn is defended. This pawn is defended by the knight. This is defended by the rook. That's defended. Everything is defended, and black's not going to lose any pawns. Let me show you what was actually played in the game. So... Black decided to play king d7. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to use your king in the endgame. In fact, that's a good thing to do. Problem is, not at the expense of a free pawn. So white simply captured the pawn, and then black made another mistake. Knight to e4. Now, why is that such a bad move? Well, there's actually two reasons. Number one, the knight was defending this pawn. Now it's not, so white can just capture it. Number two, and this is what happened in the game, white can play check and skewer this pawn over here. And so after king, trade, trade. So just like that, black just lost two pawns, right? He had a pawn here and he had a pawn here that are now gone. And so black's winning chances just went way down. Now, I would say this is still a win for black with correct play, but it's much more difficult because now he only has two pawns. And if these pawns get traded for these pawns, guess what? Black's not gonna be able to win with a rook and a bishop most likely. So protecting your pawns is super, super important. So if we go back right here, when black played king d7, that was a terrible mistake. If he plays bishop e8, everything's good for black now. He's got all these pawns. All he has to do is defend the pawns, and then he can carry on with his plan, maybe king d7, and go about his business. But giving up those pawns was a crucial mistake, and I saw a lot of games where 1600 rated players didn't make it a priority to defend their pawns at the end of the game. Okay, and I'll just show you what happened. Um, lost those two pawns and then proceeded to trade off that one and then lost the last pawn and 
ended up actually losing the bishop to a little pin here. But even had he not lost that, you know, black's not going to win this game. Best case scenario, black would probably get a draw. But by losing those pawns, he lost all his winning chances. So takeaway from this lesson is pawns are the most important thing in an endgame. That's how you win endgames. You get pawns to become queens. So if you don't have any pawns left, how are you going to win? Um, so remember that next time you're in an endgame. Okay, pawns are the most important part. All right, guys, well, like I said earlier, it does take a lot of time to go through 100 games and analyze each one of them. So if you did learn something from this video and enjoyed it, please hit the thumbs up button. Helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate it. If you're enjoying this series, be on the lookout for the next video where I'll look at 1,800 rated players' games and see what kind of mistakes they're making and how to get past that level. But as always, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.